So up until very recently, if you asked me how many videos I've made about loading for the M1 Garand, I'd be like seven, 11, it's zero. I've made zero videos. It's, it's shown up from time to time, but it, we've been like testing a reloading press or some other piece of equipment or whatever. Someone mentioned this to me recently and I, I couldn't believe it. So today's the day. We're going to shoot 30-06 in my M1 Garand and I'll do my best to show the whole process from start to finish. So we're keeping things pretty simple. For bullets, I'm going to shoot the 168 grain Sierra Match King and the 175 grain Sierra Match King. You're going to want to pick your bullets in the 150 to 180 grain range because that's, that's what load data is available. In the Hornady manual, they've got a separate section with special load data just for the M1 Garand. And the Hodgson website has specific load data for the M1 Garand. Now it's important to stick to these sources or other, you know, Garand specific sources you find rather than just generic 30-06 data. If you own one of the guns, you probably already know you're not, you're not supposed to shoot standard full power 30-06 rounds in it. They say it can damage the op rod or the bolt. So I stick pretty close to the recipes when it comes to the Garand. This isn't a platform I wanna do much experimenting with. Heavy bullets, light bullets, weird powders. It's not worth the time because my gun's probably not gonna function properly and cycle the way it's supposed to, and at worst, I could damage something. And for powders, I'm gonna shoot IMR 4895. If you're looking for powders and you've got multiple options to choose from, IMR 4895 is an easy choice. Same thing with H4895. Any of this Garand data you look at for any bullet is gonna include 4895. A lot of history there. I think this is the powder that was used in the military ball rounds. So that's powder number one. Powder number two is going to be Hodgson Varget. It's a great powder, should give us pretty similar performance to IMR 4895. For primers, I've got some Winchester WLRs, which is the primer that's listed in both the Hornady load data as well as the Hodgson, but it really doesn't matter. Any large rifle primer should do just fine. And for brass, I use this HXP. Back when I bought my gun from the CMP, they were selling old surplus Greek ammo. Still got a little bit of it left, but that's where this brass comes from. Most of it's 1977 and 1978 head stamps. Any 30 out six brass you've got ought to work just fine. So here are the loads I wanna shoot. So it'll just be four loads. I wanna load up eight shots of each so that we've got a full clip and we'll just go see how they all do. I usually shoot two or three inch groups at hundred yards with this gun. So it's a little bit hard to evaluate things for accuracy, but we'll give it a try. Now, one thing I wanna mention is how narrow the window is from the starting charge to the maximum charge in some of this load data. If we look at this from the Hodgson website, for IMR 4895, they show a starting charge of 46.0 and a max charge of 46.2. 0.2 grains is not a lot of wiggle room. With Varget, we've got a little bit bigger window, 45.0 to 46.3, but still 1.3 grains is a pretty small window on charges this big. Now, unless we make a really big mistake, running into overpressure is not really a problem here. These are well below the max load you'll find if you look in the normal 30-06 data section. So these are lower pressure, lower velocity loads where they're giving us a very narrow window, which I assume is to get us you know, right into that window where the gun is gonna function best. So back to our load data, what I did was looked at that Hodgson data, looked at my Hornady data, and came up with the charge weights that you see. Gonna be watching velocity on these really closely. If you don't have a chronograph, you might not be able to do so, but we basically know exactly what to expect. So if we're very far off, that might be a sign of trouble. A little bit off is okay, but if we're way off, that could be pointing to a problem. Could be a difference in our, uh, the capacity of our brass, the case capacity of our brass, because the Hodgson data uses Winchester cases, and I think the Hornady data uses Hornady cases, and we're shooting these old military surplus cases. So maybe the internal volume is a little more or less. Not gonna freak out about it. We'll just see what happens. So the first major part of our reloading process is brass prep. It's taking this fired brass and getting it back into a condition ready to be fired again. Since you're shooting at M1 Garand and you're picking up your brass off the dirt and out of the mud, it's gonna be dirty. So the first thing you wanna buy is a universal decapping die. We want to use this to remove our primers and make sure that primer pocket can get clean. The reason you want a universal decapping die is because this is the only thing that's ever going to see that dirty brass. Our resizing die is only going to see clean brass. Once your primers are out, you're going to tumble your brass. And I would suggest you just go ahead and buy a wet tumbling setup. 
and I'm happy to see the prices on those seem to have come down. Looks like you can get one for 75 bucks now. So a tumbler, a media separator, and a universal decapping die, there's your first $125. So once your brass is clean and dry, then you're ready to move on. And for me, that meant annealing the brass. I've got an annealese machine and ran those through there a little bit earlier. If you're just getting started, you can hold off on worrying about annealing. Annealing is used to soften the neck and shoulder of the brass so that during the resizing process, it's easier to work and less brittle. But you can get by without doing it. So that brings us to this point. That's the point I'm at. I've got clean brass that's been annealed and resizing is the next step. So these are the dies I'll be using. This is a Redding Deluxe die set. Standard 30-06, there's nothing special. There's no special grand dies. So this is a three die set, which, in, which includes a full length sizing die that sizes the whole case and a neck sizing die that only sizes the neck of our case. So with the semi-automatic M1 Garand, we will always be full length sizing. If we tried to neck size, we would almost certainly run into feeding issues. So the third die in this three die set is a bullet seating die. So unless you have a purpose for a neck sizing die, a two die set would be better. Just make sure it comes with a full length sizing die and your bullet seating die. Now, luckily you can use any brand die on any brand reloading press. So today we're gonna to use Redding dies on an RCBS press. We could use Lee dies, Hornady dies, Lyman dies, doesn't matter. So whatever catches your eye and fits your budget should work just fine. With more expensive die sets, a lot of times you're paying for a, a fancy bullet seating die with easy, easier adjustments, but they all work just fine. Now this is a standard full length sizing die. There are also small base full length sizing dies. Some particular rounds and guns need, need sized a little bit smaller. I've never had any problems in my grand with this standard full length die. It sizes enough to get the job done in my gun and you know we don't wanna, we don't wanna size more than we need to. I'd probably just stick with a standard set if I were you. So these are the two parts of the full length sizing die. The body of the die is the, the simple part, just a big hunk of metal. But the decapping assembly's got a couple things going on. A little pin in there at the end to pop out your primers. But we're not going to need that. The important part is this flat surface right here. This is what we would call the expander or the expander ball or the expander button. When the case goes up into the die, oh, I forgot all my necks are going to be bent. Find you some of the better examples. Yeah, so my, my gun does that sometimes, which is not a huge deal. But that does give me a minute to complain about the Redding decapping assembly has got this flat part on the end and it is a pain in the butt whenever a ding in your case mouth is hitting that. So some of the other brands just have a much better design here for, for spreading open problems with your, your case mouth. I was trying to think of which brand would be a good example of being better than this and it's all of them. Hornady, Lee, RCBS, Forster, they're all a little bit more tapered or have a longer taper that's a little bit, little bit better at spreading that stuff out. So. Oh, where was I? I was explaining the expander ball. Let's see if I can find a round neck. That one looks pretty good. So during the resizing process, you know, this is inside of the die. And yeah, this is fired brass with a big neck. So it just goes right over top of this, or it should. So once the neck is up higher in the die, then the body of our die is going to squeeze that neck down, smaller than we actually need it. So whenever the case starts its travel out of the die, Pulling that smaller neck over the expander is how our final, you know, final diameter, our neck diameter is set. So there's not much going on here, but it's nice to tear it apart and make sure you're, well, for one thing, you need to clean it and lube it. But another thing is that whenever you stick a case, which is always a bad situation, knowing what's going on in there can help you get out of trouble. Uh, this, this does screw off of here and the decapping pin slips in and out. You can replace it if it gets bent or broken. Most of the die brands are gonna be that way. So whenever we put this in, you just, have to, you just have to make sure your decapping pin sticks out the bottom enough. One more thing I'll mention before I move on. This is a, this is a Lee 243 die, and you'll see that it has a hole in the side. That is a pressure relief. That's something, Redding dies don't have those, at least as far as I know. All of the ones I've ever owned haven't had them, but Lee, RCBS, Hornady usually have them. And that's important in the next step, which is lubricating the cases. If the case is not lubricated properly before it's sent up into the, into the full length sizing die, it will get stuck in there. 
which is a huge pain in the butt. And I have stuck several cases in this specific die. So we'll see how it goes. The, the scope of this video might expand if we run into problems, but I'm gonna be using Redding Imperial Sizing Die Wax. This is good stuff. And I think it's especially good stuff when you're starting because you know you, you apply it by hand. Might as well go ahead and get started. It's a, I don't know, like Vaseline type of consistency. And we see it says right here, use very sparingly. And they mean very sparingly. Like the amount I just got on my fingers is probably enough to do three or four cases. Now, if I've put too much lube on these, if I was using a lead die, it would have a place to squeeze out. But with the redding die, with the redding die we're gonna be using, it will cause dents in the shoulder. It's not a huge deal unless you, unless you do it really bad. Like it's usually just small dents that, will, that you can go ahead and fire. They'll fire form out and it won't be a problem, but I don't want dented brass, you know? Now I usually end up getting things pretty good when I'm using Imperial Sizing Dye Wax, but you know, there are a lot of other different lubes. This bottle in the center is a mix of 99% isopropyl alcohol and lanolin. It's cheap to make and it works great, but getting it applied evenly can be a little bit of a challenge. I always put it on too thick and then end up needing to wipe some of it off right before I size, it's a pain in the butt. So especially today with this redding dye where I'm gonna be prone to be denting shoulders anyway, lanolin would be a nightmare. These are a couple commercial products that I've had good luck with, the RCBS K-Slick and the Hornady One-Shot. These are pretty good at avoiding shoulder dents. Both of them dry pretty uh, thin, like they don't feel greasy or, or feel like they're leaving a large coating. So either one of these would work just fine. Now, another thing to keep in mind with the Imperial Sizing Dye Wax is I wipe down the outside, but the inside of the neck of these right now is dry, which is not a good thing. So I'll end up taking a Q-tip, getting some lube on that, and getting some lube down in there. Now, you gotta keep in mind, right? So the expander ball is coming from the inside of the case out. So putting lube like around the mouth is kind of useless, right? You really need to reach in there and get it around the bottom for it to be effective. This is probably also a good time to bend any of these out that are gonna be a problem. Now, I think they'll be okay. But if you've got one that's really smashed, take something like, uh, this happens to be a decapping pin from a Lee Universal decapping die, I believe. Whatever you got laying around, and kind of pull that out a little bit. Just wanna make sure I'm not gonna have that, you know, interference I was talking about and that the case is gonna slide up in there okay. So what I'm gonna do is take a minute to get all of these lubed and then we'll move over to the reloading press. Another good thing about lubricating cases by hand is it gives you an opportunity to feel for defects. And I found this ding on the side of one of the cases. Now, just about anywhere else on the case, I wouldn't worry too much about this, but this spot here is where you have catastrophic case head separations. So it's important down here, you know, especially once you get a couple firings, although you know, it doesn't necessarily have to take a bunch of firings, but it becomes more common with more firings, you're looking for cracks and stuff right in through here. So this this got me a little bit worried. I think I'm gonna go ahead and shoot it, but I mean, it's a, it's a significant little nick there. Maybe we'll mark this one and keep track of it when we fire it. The other big place you wanna look for trouble is at the neck, you know, looking for cracks or looking for case mouth damage that's gonna make the case unusable. Here are a couple better examples on the case mouth side of things. I think I'm gonna try and Pull this one out just a little bit. There, that's much better. Go ahead and do the same to this one. Now this brass did have crimped primers. You can see the little, the little stakes around the edges. They make primer crimp removal tools or we can get in there with our little case mouth chamfering tool to cut them off if we need to. But with this brass, I haven't really found it to be a problem. The new primers just go right in. So I'm not gonna worry about it. So the centerpiece of a reloading bench is a reloading press. The dies that we've already talked about, like our full length sizing die, are gonna screw right into the top of this guy. Then the case gets put into the shell holder right here, and we pull the handle to bring the brass up into the die. Could spend a lot of time here talking about presses. This is an RCBS Rebel. Get rid of that. So yeah, this is an RCBS Rebel. This is a single stage press, which means we'll put one die into the press at a time. There are also turret presses, which have a rotating top part, usually, that you can put multiple dies into. Like the Redding T7 will hold seven dies. Some hold like four, but they all hold more than one. So single stage is one die. 
So this Rebel is an O-frame press, very, very strong. Pretty much all of the companies sell a smaller little press like this dinky little Lee. I don't know what these are going for right now, but they used to be like 30 bucks. Pretty much all of the companies are gonna have something smaller that you might wanna avoid, or you'll wanna be absolutely sure that it's like the, the opening is large enough and that you know other people seem to be loading 30-06 on it maybe. The problem with this, this whole discussion though is the difference between can you do something and should you do something. I think this Lee in particular has plenty of room for 30-06 and I'm pretty sure I've used it for 30-06 in the past, but it, it's just a tough way to go about it. It's a really tough way to go about it. So the little Lee reloader, I think the, there's the Lyman Ideal maybe, the RCBS Partner Press, if you're going with one of those, just make sure you know what you're getting into. It might be perfect for you, but I'm just saying, be careful. Something like the RCBS Rebel or the RCBS Rock Chucker, or like this little guy, the Lee Breech Lock. It's an inexpensive O-frame press that would be just fine for this sort of work. So there's lots of good options. And other than warning you about those smaller presses, I don't have much to say about what to avoid. Prices seem to be all over the place right now. I saw this kit, the, the RCBS Rebel Master Kit on sale for like 300 bucks over at Midway and in stock. So stuff seems to be available and going for a decent price here in late summer 2022. So this right here is the shell holder I mentioned a minute ago. It just pops out. If you buy a Lee die set, they come with a shell holder, but the Redding set we're using today did not come with this. So you'll have to watch. You'll definitely need one unless you get a press that doesn't use shell holders. There's a couple of those out there. The Forster Coax and the Frankfurt Arsenal M-Press, a couple examples. But most presses are going to use shell holders and most die kits are going to re require you ordering it separately. All right, so that just snaps in and our brass slides in and out. So the setup of most sizing dies have you lift the, lift the ram all the way up and then screw the die down until you feel it touch the shell holder. There it is right there. And then most instructions will tell you to go a little bit farther and lock the die down at that position. And that works. Tell you what, let's go ahead and, let's go ahead and try to size a piece. So right up into the die. Takes a fair amount of force to get it all the way up in there. I usually take a break for a second or two and gather my thoughts and then drop it. So there's our first piece of sized brass. But let's take a couple measurements real quick. So you've already dropped 100 bucks on brass cleaning crap, 300 bucks on a press kit, and 50 bucks on dies. So hopefully if you just reach that point that you don't care anymore. A couple more things you need. You need some reloading trays. Gotta hold your brass. Don't forget those. And you need some calipers because your press kit is not gonna come with calipers. This is an eye gauging set from Amazon. They're pretty cheap. I need to get a new battery for this one. The last time I tried to use it, it was freaking out. I'll try and use it anyway. So what I just clamped in here is called the Hornady Headspace Comparator. And I believe 30-06 uses the, the 375 bushing. So the silver part is a bushing. What this is used for is measuring from the base of the case to the shoulder. And it looks like we're getting 2.047 inches. That piece has not been resized. Here's another piece that has not been resized, and it is the same, 2.047. Next piece is just a little bit longer, 2.048. So when we're setting up our sizing die, we want to make sure that we're not shortening this measurement too much. We call it bumping the shoulder. So at 2.047, let's go ahead and uh, zero the calipers, and let's look at the piece that we resized. So here it is and it's measuring seven and a half thousandths shorter. So we bumped the shoulder seven and a half thousandths, or seven, whatever, doesn't matter. So that is probably more than we need. So for most of the stuff I shoot in an AR, I shoot for about three thousandths. So I need to go back to the sizing die and back it out just a little bit. Now sizing the brass less, or you know, bumping the shoulder less, is gonna mean longer case life and less stretching, less trimming. There's really no downside, other than the fact that you need to buy a headspace comparator and the kit isn't that cheap it's a little bit annoying now in this case where it was seven that's not the end of the world but i've had situations where it was like 15 which really has to do with the difference between the way your chambers cut and the way your dies cut right 
Okay, I'll back that out just a little bit. Let's try to size the next one. backed it out just a little bit too far. I'm not bumping it enough now. So, Okay, let's try there. Okay, like four adjustments later, I finally, I've got about two and a half thousandths of bump, but I'm getting a little, getting a little bit inconsistent readings. It might be, you know, this brass is, what, 45 years old? And maybe I didn't get it annealed properly, which that's another thing I should mention. If you're not annealing, occasionally this can be frustrating. Or if you're working with mixed brass, trying to get consistent readings when you know the different brands of brass or even lots of brass are sizing and springing back and stuff a little bit different from one another. Okay, that one's at three. Yeah, I've got one piece that just doesn't want to budge for me here. It's not doing much of anything. I'll mark it so we can keep track of it, but it'll probably be just fine. Now, just in these first few pieces, I've had a couple more that I just can't get to want to bump. So I'm going to screw this die back down in a little bit farther. Yeah, that's pretty much as low as you would want it to go, making really good contact with the shell holder. And I'll just roll with this. Last thing you want is to get out to the range and have feeding issues. And then you don't know if it is it your load, is it your gun, is it your brass sizing process. Man, some of these are taking a lot of force to get up into the die. They come out okay though. Okay, so sizing's done, and this was just a little bit weird. I ended up getting them all, you know, to size. Looks like they all bumped the shoulder at least a couple thousandths. But there were a couple pieces where I had to lube them and size them one more time to get them where I wanted them. Kind of weird. Okay, so the next step, I need to wipe off all of this lube. It's a little bit time consuming, but the outside only takes a second, but since I wiped it all over the inside of the necks, I'm gonna go back in with another Q-tip and just clean them out real quick. I'm not in a big hurry. Throw on a YouTube video or something, take my time. And this is also another you know good opportunity for inspection, just to make sure you didn't get a neck split or something during sizing. So our next step is gonna to be to trim the brass. Generally with every firing and resizing, the brass is gonna stretch a bit. So I feel like we've spent about enough money for now. Let's go the cheap route. So this Lee trimming setup is about $13. It's two different parts. There's a shell holder and I'm not gonna remove it, but so this is the case length gauge. So these two pieces are the case length gauge and shell holder. You gotta buy that as the first part. Then you need the cutter and the lock stud. So the cutter and lock stud, is the second part. They're like six, six or seven dollars a piece. So we just slide our case in here and tighten it down. And here in a second, I'll chuck that up in a drill, but you can also do it by hand. We just put the case length gauge down into there and start cutting. So the trim length in the manual is 2.485. Let's see, see where we're at. So we're getting 2.481. And the trim length in the manual is 2.484, so this is cutting them just a little bit short, and I'm totally okay with that. This is not adjustable in any way, so it just is what it is. So once the trimming's done, then I'll come in with a deburring and chamfering tool. This came with your press kit, probably. Once that's done, case prep is finished. This is ready for primer, powder, and bullet. So now that our brass prep is done, the process goes really quick from this point. We need to put in our primers, and I'm going to use an RCBS hand primer. Let's take our little tray. Let's see, how many do we need? Eight, 32. There's 31, 32. When we shake this around, they should all orient themselves properly, eventually. Now, just like how there's a million ways to trim brass, there's a million ways to prime brass as well. I like this universal primer from, from RCBS. 
I have a couple of them. I have I keep one set up for large primers and the other set up for small primers. As you put each one in, you know, and you squeeze it in there, you're able to feel it go in and bottom out. And then whenever you take it out, I generally run my finger over them to make sure that the, the primer's sitting a little bit below flush, and that should be good. And like I mentioned earlier, the, the primer crimp in this brass just really doesn't seem to get in the way. Now for weighing out our powder charges, we'll do some of them the easy way and some of them the hard way. First is the easy way. This is my RCBS Charge Master Lite. We'll start with IMR4895, and we just dump it into the back of the unit here. Something I like to use are check weights for the scale, just to make sure things are working properly before get started. There's 20 grains, here's 20 more, and here's 10 more. So the scale's looking good today. Our first charge is 47.5, and we hit go. Grab our powder funnel. One of these should come in just about any press kit you happen to get. Now these sorts of things get pretty confusing. I've got my IMR4895 charges weighed out and I went ahead and capped them off with their bullets. 168's on the left, 175's on the right. I'm thinking ahead to my bullet seating step and when I seat bullets, what I would like to do is do all of the 168s, then adjust my seating die, then do the 175s. You know, a couple different ways I could do it, but I, I could go ahead and seat all of the bullets on our 4895 charges, and then start over, weigh out all of the Varget, and do that as a, as a second step as well. But this is the way I've chosen to do it, and it's very easy to screw this up. So I'm gonna try and scoot these out of the way, and then I'm gonna empty the Charge Master light. Emptying these is the biggest pain in the butt of using them. It's not too bad. I've managed not to spill anything yet. I'm done with IMR 4895. So in comes Varget. In comes a little bowl. Dump some out into here. I'm gonna grab my trickler as well. And we'll fill it up with powder. Next is my little scale that I've, I've had warming up for a couple hours now. This is a cheap scale I bought on Amazon. And it works pretty good. Let's try a couple check weights. There's 20 grains. Here's 20 more. And then here's 10 more. Okay, it's uh, pretty close. There it went. Okay, looking good. Okay, so our first charge is 47.0. I'm going to be using one of these little Lee scoops. You can buy a whole kit of these with a bunch of different sizes for very little money. And they come in very handy. So if this scoop isn't quite enough, ah, pretty close, 44.7. So then from there, I can use the trickler. I need to get it flowing first. There it goes. So it should be able to trickle this up to 47.0. Too far. Sometimes it's it's good to pick it up and just sit it back down, let it take another reading. So 47, maybe it's good. Yep, that looks good. Should be able to take a little bit bigger scoop this time. Looks good. Now a couple things about using a cheap scale. 
or any scale for that matter. They are extremely sensitive to air currents. So any vents and stuff in the area you need to close. And they can also be sensitive to nearby like uh, fluorescent lights and stuff like that. So if you've got a scale that just gives you crazy, crazy readings or always uh, drifts on you or something, take it to a whole, a completely different location and see if it acts the same way. A lot of times it's, it's either air currents or some sort of local electrical interference. Okay, so powder's closed up. I still haven't spilled anything. So before I put bullets on top of the cases, I want to get up above and visually inspect and make sure that I didn't miss any charges. Okay, they've all got powder in them. Okay, I think we're ready for bullet seating. Okay, so we're done with our full length sizing die. And now we need our seating die. Might as well pull it apart and show it to you. It's a pretty simple setup. So this part here from the top is where the bullet will actually interface with the adjustment screw. Seems to fit pretty good. So most seating dies have got a crimp in them, or at least a lot do. This one definitely does. So the instructions from Redding tell you to screw this down until it touches the shell holder and then back it out a particular number of turns. Let me look real quick. Yeah, you screw it in until it touches the shell holder. If no crimp is desired, back the seating die one turn away from the shell holder. And I imagine that would work just fine. But what you can also do is take a case with no bullet and raise it up and then screw the die down until you feel the die touch the case. That will be the little crimp inside of there touching the case mouth. And it looks like it's right about there. So I don't want any crimp. I want to make sure that that crimping ring in there is back, backed off of that case mouth a little ways. Hopefully that made sense. Just want to make sure that I've got clearance and that we're not accidentally crimping. Okay, so now I'll set the bullet on there and we can start the seating stem just a little bit. Go ahead and raise it up and see if the bullet's even touching yet. It's not, so I'll screw this down until it feels like it is. Then drop this and screw that in a little ways. All right, let's see, let's see where that puts us. That should seat the bullet a little bit. Should still be extremely long. And our target is 3.3 inches. And right now we're 3.443. So long way to go. So I'm just making pretty small adjustments and then checking it. Don't want to go too far. All right, I think this is going to be pretty close right here. Kinda, I'm at 3.306. So I want to go ahead and seat another one and see where it's at. That one's 3.304, so definitely a little bit long. Okay, very small adjustment. Should put us really close, 3.301. 3.303. I'm going to seat a couple more. A little bit of variation in our overall length number is normal because hollow point match bullets like these Sierra Match Kings have got pretty irregular hollow points. Sometimes they've got a little part that sticks up or something. But yeah, they're all still 3.304 to 3.306. So I'm going to go ahead and come down a little bit more. And I'm probably going to go with this setting no matter what it is. It's got to be pretty close. 3.301. 3.3, exactly, 3.303, 3.302, close enough. I actually went with 3.3, that's what was on the Hodgton load data, but in the Sierra manual for their normal 30-06 load data, I think they shoot like 3.320 in my ammo box. Might as well put them where they belong. This bullet seating feels really good. It should feel smooth. You know, it should feel like the bullet's sliding right down in there like it wants to. Now, I think these two bullets, the 168 and the 175, have the same ogive shape. So this seating die setting would probably be pretty darn close with the other bullet as well. But they're always a little bit different. So let's back off a little bit. I'm actually going to back out one turn, which I think is 50 thousandths on a Redding adjuster. Let's see where it puts us. Fifty-two thousands too long, so I need to put it right back where it was. Down one turn and run it back through. Three point three zero two. The next one here. Three point three zero four. I'm just going to roll with it. Close enough. So 
So I kind of started jumping over things pretty quick here at the end, but hopefully this was a halfway decent overview of the, of the process. I could make this video 10 hours long talking about all of the different options for all of the different gear that you might consider. And that's not really what I want this video to be, but hopefully I've hit some of the important stuff. All right, down to the last three here. All right, that's it. Let's get out to the range. Okay, so it's time to get started. I've got a target at 100 yards and I've got the shot marker electronic target system running. So I've hung up one of these NRA SR1 targets. It's a pretty comfortable target to aim at and I've got perfect weather. It's mostly overcast, so I should be able to see my sights pretty well today. So I wanna take a couple warm up shots before we move on to the ammo we loaded today. I loaded these in the past with the 165 grain Hornady SST with IMR 4895. So we'll give these a try, make sure our sights are close and we'll check the chronograph and the shot marker and all that stuff. So, all right, let's see what happens here. I think that's probably good enough for a warm up. That first shot went a good bit low. Total group size is 3.74 inches. Let's hide this one. And the other four went into 2.86. So we're looking good. Let's see if I can remember how to unload this thing. That, and then the button on the side. There it goes. So I bought this grand from the, from the CMP six or seven years ago, maybe something like that. It did come with a new stock and a new barrel, I believe, and it shoots and functions really good, in my opinion, which is what I was hoping for. You know, when I bought it, I wanted something I felt like I could shoot, and that's definitely what this is. Okay, the target is clear, so let's move on to the first of our hand loads from today. This is the 168 grain Sierra Match King, and this is 47.5 grains of IMR 4895. Things don't want to feed. Charging handle needed a little bit of a push there. All right, let's see if it shoots. So that first velocity was 2629, which is a little bit lower than I expected. According to the manuals, it should be 2700 to 2750. So that's good. I'd rather be a little bit slow than a little bit fast. So I'm pretty happy with this start. That's a 3.05 inch group. The velocity average was 2644, standard deviation 13.1, extreme spread of 41. Not much to complain about here. The brass I picked up is looking good and that group included the piece with that nick on the side, right around where the case head separation would happen and it's fine. There wasn't any gas leakage out of it or anything. So we survived that. So let's clear the target and move on to the next one. This is 47.0 grains of Varget. Still with the 168 grain Match King. So the first velocity on that one's pretty low, 25.45. Really wasn't expecting that.
and then that one was 2632. It's not good to see. Well, this is pretty weird. So that first shot that was super low on velocity went much lower than the others. Let's hide it real quick. Yep, the other seven went into 1.38 inches. So I'm not sure what to blame. My normal go-to would be to blame my own side alignment, but we got that crazy velocity on that shot as well. Huh, okay. Average velocity was 26.19 with a standard deviation of 40.2. But if I remove that first shot, the average is 26.31 with a standard deviation of 25.3. So not great numbers either way, but that first shot was definitely a problem. All right, I'm gonna let the gun cool down for a few minutes before we move on. Okay, time to move on to the 175 grain Sierra Match King. First up is 46.0 grains of IMR 4895. So the first velocity there was 2526, and I had written down to expect 2550 to 2630. So we're in the right ballpark. So we don't really have any redeeming qualities to talk about here. The group was huge, 6.93 inches, and it wasn't even trying to group. The velocity was 2568, which was within my window of what to expect, so that's good. Standard deviation 26.9 and an extreme spread of 78. I did notice towards the end of that group, I had really let my face drift backward and my distance to the peep had gotten farther than I like. So I don't know, this, this one, I really didn't feel like I was holding particularly good during that group either. So let's move on. 46.0 grains of Varget with the 175 grain Sierra Match King. Maybe that last group got us warmed up. So during the later part of that group, the sun started coming out and my hold got a lot better. I didn't realize how dark the target was or how much it was affecting me. So yeah, that's a, that's a strong finish there. If we get rid of these first two shots, the last six shots went into 2.29 inches. The velocity was 2547, standard deviation was 17.3. So the velocities kind of, they all kind of came in on the low end today and I'd much rather be there than unexpectedly high. So, all right, pretty, pretty good little day on the range here with the Grand. A couple of promising groups, a very humbling marksmanship experience. The gun ran smooth and everything was safe. Hard to beat that. All right, let's get back to the bench. So our fired brass looked pretty good today. I think that's our friend with the nick around the web. Looks like it got flattened out quite a bit, but no signs that gas leaked out or anything like that. So I think we're okay. That's about what the primers look like. Just not really much to show you here. Now, while you're out on the range and firing, a couple things to look out for. First is case head separations like we've been talking about. That can mean you are way over pressure. So if you ever see one of those, you stop everything and try to figure out what's going on. With the primer, it can be difficult to, to tell what's good and what's bad. And you really kind of need to get to know your gun. And once you kind of get to know the baseline of what 
a fired primer looks like. You want to keep an eye out for it getting flatter than that. So sometimes like the rounded edges of your primer will be gone and you'll just be able to tell that the, flam the primer is very flattened. That can be a sign of pressure. You also need to keep an eye out for pierced primers. Where the firing pin strike happens, sometimes that will blow out. That's usually a sign of high pressure, as well as popped primers. You know, if you're picking up brass where the primers are missing, that can be bad. And beyond that, you're just, you know, keeping an eye out for splits, especially in the neck. And I guess that's about it. You're basically just watching, looking for anything abnormal. You get to know your brass, you know what it looks like, and you can learn a lot by keeping an eye on it. You can also just get really confused. It's kind of like reading tea leaves. So now that I've edited the range portion of the video and had a second look, like those, those Vargat loads were just shooting better, a whole lot better. Still don't have any explanation for that one low shot on our second group. It had that weird low velocity and landed way outside of the group. So may maybe I made a mistake. That was, so Vargat was the ones where I hand weighed every charge. That always makes me nervous. I usually keep my notebook you know, right beside my scale and my trickler so I can constantly look back and double check my number. But mistakes can happen. Maybe instead of 47 grains, that one got 46.0, like the 175s were supposed to get. But once we ignore that one, man, that's a really good group. And then later with the 175 grain bullet, that was another good group. You know, dropped those first couple shots low, but the rest of them started stacking right in there. So feeling pretty good about it, especially, you know, that 47 grains of Vargit with the 168. Until further notice, that's probably going to be my go-to load. I may be a little bit concerned about the feeding issues I had. Like sometimes trying to get that clip in there and get that first round in was a little bit of a pain in the butt. So maybe tweaking the overall length a little bit shorter maybe. I don't know. And luckily we didn't have any feeding issues after that first round. So I'm probably just not going to worry about it. So I think that's pretty much it. There's a ton of stuff I wish I would have talked about. Like th these loads with the 168 grain bullet, I had no perfect load data. The, the load data I was working from were from Hornady bullets and I think a Nosler bullet. So you want to be extra careful whenever you're doing that. And it can especially get you into trouble if you run into load data for solid copper bullets. Like the Hodgton data includes, I believe, the Hornady GMX and I think the Nosler E-tip. Those bullets are all copper and copper is much lighter than lead. So all copper bullets are generally much longer and that has a lot of effect on the load data. So there's a lot of little things like that I wish I would have mentioned. Just things to be aware of. Or crimping, didn't even really discuss crimp. In this cartridge, the only time I would crimp is whenever my bullet has a cane lure, the little ring around the bullet that's kind of made for crimping the mouth into. So I'll crimp whenever my cane lure is going to line up with the case mouth, but usually only because I feel like I, I'm supposed to. With a cartridge like 30-06 where the neck is so long and the bearing surface of the bullet is so big, there's just a lot of contact there. If you run into problems where bullets are moving, they're falling out or they're getting jammed back in during feeding in the rifle, you're not going to fix that with crimp or crimping more heavily. You've got a neck tension problem. You need more neck tension. So that's another, that's a discussion for another day. But if you're worried at all about crimp, like don't worry about it. So I think that's where I'll leave it, folks. Appreciate you guys joining me. I hope you found the video entertaining or informative and I'll see you guys next time.